This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is an actor, director, and producer who rose to international stardom as one of the most popular and beloved child stars of the 70s and 80s. He first captured our hearts as Loomis on the TV show Fish, and then as Willis Jackson on Different Strokes. He's also appeared in dozens of movies, including Thursday the 12th, The Sounds of Silence, Turning Point, Dead Ringer, Nightblade, Hospital Arrest, Hope for the Holidays, Sheer Bloody Murder, and many more. And on television, in addition to his iconic work on Fish and Different Strokes, he appeared in the groundbreaking miniseries Roots, as well as on Little House on the Prairie, The Waltons, The Facts of Life, Circle of Pain, The Young and the Restless, Everybody Hates Chris, and many more TV shows and movies. But behind that beautiful smile and charismatic talent as an actor and enormous likability, this is a man who has had to overcome a number of exceedingly difficult traumas and obstacles, including child abuse and betrayal of the worst kind, as well as police harassment, racism, wrongful prosecution, and vicious treatment by the tabloid press, while he was struggling to overcome a very severe and debilitating substance abuse addiction. In 2010, he wrote a highly compelling, heart-wrenching and unforgettable memoir entitled Killing Willis, From Different Strokes to the Mean Streets to the Life I Always Wanted, in which he chronicles his tumultuous and gut-wrenching journey from the heights of superstardom to the depths of despair through his addiction, criminal court prosecutions, and long road to rehab, recovery, and healing, and to rebuilding the highly successful career and family life he is now enjoying and so richly deserves. Our guest has given so much back to the community. In 1992, he founded the Todd Bridges Youth Foundation, and in 2010, he became the official spokesperson for ICDC College's Alcohol and Drug Counseling Program. Through his work as an addiction counselor and founder of the Society for Ethical Addiction Treatment, he has helped thousands of people conquer their drug and alcohol addictions and live positive, constructive lives. And I can tell you, as a retired criminal court judge who knows only too well what this man has been through, it's truly an honor to have him here with us. I'm delighted to welcome Todd Bridges to our show. Todd, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. You wrote in your book that you knew you were going to be a star when you were only five years old. How did you know, Todd? You know, when I had watched Red Fox on uh, his TV show, Sanford and Son, I knew I was going to be just like Red Fox and be a star. I knew that right away. Now, you've been very open about the trauma you suffered as a child, both from your father, who was physically and emotionally abusive, and also from your publicist, who was a sexual predator. I'm not going to go into detail, Todd, because I want people to read it for themselves in the book. But Todd, I want to ask you this. When I look at your performances on screen as a child, you were able to show a lot more emotion than other child actors. And I had the impression that you found it easy to cry if a scene required you to do that. Do you see a connection between the abuse you suffered and your acting skills as a child? I think every actor does that. You have to find somewhere to draw from as an actor. And even as a child actor, you have to find somewhere to, to, uh, to do that. And I was able to just process it in so many ways and really live what I've seen and gone through to be able to, you know, to put it on film. And I think, I like you know, like a lot of comedians, are hiding behind a lot of pain. I don't know if you know that or not, but they are, you know? Um, so every actor uses different tools to become the best at their craft. A lot of people say that being a child actor is unfair because of all the stress and the pressure. But I would imagine, Todd, that in your case, you were happy to be acting because it was an escape for you. Am I right? Oh yeah, it was definitely an escape for me to get out of the house with my dad, you know, the way he was, it was acting towards us. You know, to be on the set with my mom was a very relief for me. You know, not many kids can say that, you know, but I also, you know, at that time I, I played uh, Little League Baseball, Pop Warner Football. I did all those things. So I didn't miss out on my childhood at all. 
Now, a lot of people may not realize that you had a very impressive career as a child, even before Fish and Different Strokes. You appeared in Roots, which is one of the most groundbreaking and highest rated miniseries in television history. You were the first Black actor on Little House on the Prairie and the Waltons. But for some reason, whenever there's a documentary about the pioneer Black actors and actresses in the history of television, your name is almost never mentioned. Why do you think that is? I don't know, man, but that's one of the things that that's one of the things that's very upsetting about me is how we don't support each other in the right manner. You know, I open the door for a lot of actors, especially a minority actors, to be able to come through and be able to do things. I think, unfortunately, some of us sometimes we literally look at the past of somebody and we're not able to move past that. Other races move right past that. And, you know, a good example is this. Robert Downey Jr. has a very tumultuous past also, but yet... He was able to start doing movies again. He was able to move forward. You know, the only, it's interesting, TV show that was Black that I was on was Everybody Hates Chris. I was never cast in any other Black show that was on television. And two of the women that had several shows on, I was the reason why they got hired on different strokes so they could be able to become producers. That was because of me, because there was not enough Black people there, you know, and I, I did that. But unfortunately, I, you know, it's, it's something that we all have to live with. You know, it's something that most minority actors, especially black actors, have to deal with. We just do. You can glad. sit around and let it bother you or you can move forward, you know? I'm really glad that I had this opportunity on our show to highlight that aspect of your career because there's so much more to you as a groundbreaking actor than different strokes. But of yeah. course, I have to ask you a few questions about different strokes. You were 13 when the show started. It ran for eight mm-hmm. seasons. You played yep. Coleman's older brother, Willis Jackson, and your adoptive sister, Kimberly Drummond, was played by Dana Plato. Yep. The show was groundbreaking at that time because it had a mixed cast who Mm -hmm. expressed love for each other and the black characters and white characters were presented as equals. Do you know if the network received a lot of complaints from racist people? Yeah, we got complaints from both sides in the beginning. Very much so. People were not happy with what the show was presenting, but it was more people happy about it than there were people not happy about it. And that's why the show continued to be number one for such a long time. And, you know, the only reason why we got canceled really was because, you know, the Coleman's messed with the network too much and the network got tired of it. We should have gone on to be at least 13, 14 years. We would have because we helped save NBC at that time. You know, that was before the Cosby, before all those other shows. My favorite episode of Different Strokes was the one featuring Muhammad Ali. Oh, uh, yeah. That's one can, of my favorite ones. Can you share any memories of being with him? Oh, yeah. Muhammad Ali was such a, he was so great. He was fast. He still was quick. You know, he would do these little things behind your ears. You turn around and he'd be like, gotcha. <laughs> Muhammad Ali was, that was one of my heroes, you know, and working with him was just, was an honor. Definitely. I, I remember, you know, getting his autograph, getting all that stuff, man. He's just a wonderful guy. He was wonderful back then. He was really good with kids, too, which is really great. You wrote in your book, Todd, that once Gary Coleman became a huge star, his parents isolated him from everyone and they didn't even want him to be friends with you anymore. Why do you think they did that? Well, you know, it's interesting that the Coleman thought that they were better than everybody else, you know, unfortunately. And they directed that toward Gary. And that's why Gary had so many other emotional issues after that. You know, I mean, you know, when you sue your parents to get money back that they've stolen from you, That ought to tell you something right there (laughs) about who the kind of people you are. Uh, Absolutely. Do you know why you were not in the last two episodes of Different Strokes? The last episode I wasn't in. Yeah, it's because that was Willie Coleman's way of punishing me for not putting up with his stuff. (laughs) That's why. You know, that's so unfair because you were a very important character in that show. And I'm sorry he didn't seem to recognize that. Even though he got famous, you were getting very famous, too. Yeah, the girls liked me. So that was the best part of it. (laughs) Everybody liked you, Todd. I appreciate that. Thank you. (laughs) In season five of Different Strokes, you did an episode called Bicycle Man. Oh, yeah about a sexual predator stalking Arnold and his friend, that must have been very difficult for you. It was, but I I had asked to be written out a little more out of that episode. I didn't want to be in that episode that much. But the interesting part about it, the studio at the time knew what had happened to me, but they didn't want me to go to the police about it because they didn't want to mess the show up, so. 
I was told not to do it. Well, I tell you, it's such an important thing you did to write that book and to illuminate the reality, not only of what goes on sometimes in show business, but what can happen to children. And I'm just so proud of That's you. Right. Now, when you were a young teenager, Maurice White of Earth, Wind and Fire signed you to a record deal, hoping to make you into the next Michael Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. The interesting part about that was we had the album completely done. And then Arc Records fell and CBS took all the songs and all the albums they had created and didn't release them. So what's happened to that album? Is there some way that it can be released now? I've been trying to find it. It's hard to find it. I had, you remember, you know, the thing about it is I have it on, on cassette tape. That's all we had back then. <laughs> I didn't have the masters, though. So I got to try to find it. I would love to release it now. Oh, my God. That would be so great. Another yeah. thing, you almost landed a role in the movie The Breakfast Club, but they actually told you they didn't <laughs> know how to put a black character in the film, which is just mind boggling. Yeah, did they didn't know how to write for a black person. And how I was did like, you react to that? Write for a white person. <laughs> That's what I told them. <laughs> it's just shocking, isn't it? Yeah. John Hughes really wanted me in the film, but his partner did not. John Hughes was a really good guy. He really wanted me. I was on a plane ride from with John Hughes all the way back from New York. And he was like, I want you in this in this movie. You know, go meet my partner and uh, we'll figure out what role you're going to play. And never got the role because, he, you know, the, his partner did, couldn't see a black guy being in that role. Which was funny because at the time you got everybody in detention and not one minority in detention. <laughs> I can't think about that movie the same way ever since yeah. I read your book. I've got to tell you the truth. I appreciate that. Now, in addition to the abuse you suffered as a child, Todd, you also experienced severe racism and harassment from the oh, Los yeah. Angeles Police Department, so oh, yeah. much so that you eventually retained the renowned legal counsel, Johnny Cochran, and you sued them. The yeah. harassment got so bad that at one point you were actually arrested for stealing your own car. I know this may sound weird, but do you think that being famous might actually have caused the police to be even more abusive to you than to oh, other yeah, black I kids? Definitely, I definitely believe that. You know, they were upset and mad that I was making, you know, doing well, driving a nice car. They, you know, like one of them one time told me, what's a guy like you doing in a car like this? You know, <laughs> and, you know, after being harassed for so long, you know, you start being smart mouth back to them, you know, because you get tired of it. But it's interesting because I was the first one to start talking about how bad they were. And nobody believed me. Everyone thought, oh, he's just some trouble kid. And then now, 2024, they're like, oh, he was completely telling the truth. You know, we, we see it now. We know it's true. You know, and, and, and that's the interesting thing about it. A few years ago, we had a retired Black police officer from the LAPD on our show by the name of Joe Jones, who wrote mm -hmm. a book entitled The Tragic Life of a Black L.A. Cop. Oh, I encourage everybody to read that book because it's a real eye opener and it absolutely reinforces and validates everything Todd has said about the racism yep. he was subjected to. From what you know, Todd, have things improved with the LAPD? Uh, yeah, you know, I think since they got cameras and all that, like I'm not, I don't get pulled over any, really anymore unless I'm doing something wrong. And that's all I want, you know, is to treat me like a regular person. You know, don't pull me over because I'm black. I mean, they used to be going... I remember this so vividly today, even today, they'd be going the opposite direction, see us, turn around and pull us over. They used to do that notoriously. And then write us a fictitious ticket about something that we weren't even doing. It's very hard for someone who hasn't been through that kind of racism and discrimination and harassment to understand it. But somehow you found the way in your book to really put us in your shoes did you know you were such a good writer? Uh, no. Well, actually, I, I had a little help with, with a, a lady. With, you know, but it's all my voice. We, it's all my voice. And she did, a, we, she did a fabulous job capturing everything that I was saying. She was amazing when she did that. She was amazing at what she did, was able to capture. Well, now, you've gone to great lengths over the years, Todd, to explain to the public the reasons why you got addicted to drugs, which had to do oh, not yeah. only with the numbing of the pain that you were feeling inside, but from the abuse you experienced, and specifically because when you reported this sexual abuse to your parents, your father didn't believe you and neither did yeah. the police, which is not only heartbreaking, but shocking. And frankly, Todd, as a former judge, it makes my blood boil. Oh, so yeah. Todd, 
If there's someone watching this interview who's in the same position you were in back then, being so badly victimized and not being believed by the authorities, what advice would you give them? Oh, my advice is go put it on the internet, you know, go to the internet, go to YouTube, go to Twitter and tell your story until somebody's ready to listen. Because, you know, you don't want to destroy yourself for some creep doing something to you, you know? And, and that's the thing, you know, I allowed that, that creep, you know, for me to destroy myself at that time. And it shouldn't happen that way, you know? Destroy them, don't destroy yourself, you know? Expose who they really are, go to the police. Well, at least if we know the police now will listen, you know, they will listen now and they will investigate it. That's the good thing about it. You know, back then a lot of people got away with things because it was he say, she say. But now they'll at least they'll look into it, they'll investigate it and see if it's true. So that, that's the good part about it. Well, in your case, it's worse because you did report it. Your own father didn't believe yeah. it. The studio knew about it. You know, I think there's a special place reserved in hell for people like that horrible publicist. Oh, yeah. And for every child abuser. Now, oh, in yeah. your book, have you seen that new Nickelodeon thing? What happened to those to Josh? Yes. That's incredibly terrible, too, you know, I, you know, it's, and it's, it's terrible, you know. No, it hasn't improved, I can tell you. Now, in your book, you described in great detail the life you lived while you were an addict. You said the drug world in South Central Los Angeles was brutal, uncaring, and unforgiving. Look, oh, yeah. Looking back, Todd, are you surprised that you survived? No, I had, I had... I was able to adapt to whatever surroundings I was in. At that point, it was like you, I could, it was like I was playing a role. I was, wasn't myself, I was playing a role. And how far you go is how much you can survive in that role. And that's how well I survived, I played that role to survive. You know, I'm just glad that I did make it out, you know? I, and and it's, for me, it's all blessed because of God. I wouldn't have made it out no other way. You know, God was in my corner the whole time getting me through it. And I truly believe it's because he wants me to talk to people about it and explain to people that there is a better way. Was there ever a time while your life was so terribly out of control that you knew deep down inside that you would one day get sober and turn your life around? You know, at the time, I didn't think it was possible. You know, at the time when I was deep down in there, I didn't think it was possible. But then I started seeing glimmers of light, you know, that I knew there's another way. I realized that when people hurt you, you don't hurt yourself back, you know, and you don't hurt someone else outward. You fix yourself and then you expose who they are, you know, the right way. I learned that. And I learned that, you know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, not vengeance is mine, saith Todd. <laughs> I've learned that too. <laughs> well, the best vengeance, I think, is what you've done, the life you're living and the oh, message yeah. you're spreading. Now, you spent almost a year in jail waiting for your trial, another six yep. months later on for your final set of charges. As a retired judge, I just can't resist asking you this, Todd. Mm -hmm. If you could make one change to the correctional system to make it better for inmates to be rehabilitated, how would you change the system? I think, first of all, we have to make it safer for the prisoners in there. It's like, the unfortunately, the inmates are running the prison, you know, and we have a lot of guards that are in on getting in cell phones, making more money. You know, I understand that part, but I think that we need actually rehabilitation. We shouldn't put people in jail for being on drugs. That's one thing we should, shouldn't do either. That's a total mistake. You're not going to, when you put a person, I remember when they put me in jail for using drugs, the whole time I'm in there, I'm thinking when I get out, I'm going to do this drug, I'm going to do this drug. So, it, you know, I need proper guidance. The person, people who are addicts, need proper guidance. And then people also who are drug dealers need a proper guidance, need to know that there is a better way also, you know? And because, you know, I, I think there is no, in the prison system, when you go into it, you realize that it's, it's very racist, very sided. You have to choose your own sides. You know, it was fortunate to where I was able to like talk to everybody. I was okay for me to talk to everyone. But if a fight broke out, I had to fall to my own side. And that, that sometimes does carry on out in the streets. It does, you know? And that's why a lot of these gang violence stuff, you know, it starts in jails and then carries out to the streets. But I really think people need Jesus. That's what I think people need. More of us need Jesus because we need to find some type of relief inside of ourselves and with someone with a higher power, for sure. You were the subject of many 
very mean-spirited tabloid headlines in the late oh, yeah. 80s and in the 90s. Even when you were found not guilty of your criminal charges, the media oh, yeah. still treated you as if you were guilty and showed oh, yeah. you, they showed you absolutely no compassion. Yeah. How did you cope with that very unkind and very unfair media coverage? You know, I cope with it by not reading anything, you know what I mean? And not doing anything, just kind of like hiding out. And I started working inside the treatment and I concentrated all my power on working at a, at a program and helping people. I didn't want anything to do with the, with the business. You know, even to this very day, you know, I'm 31 years sober and people will still bring up my past. You know, they don't do it to Robert Downey Jr. They don't do it to anybody else, they just do it to me. I don't know what it is they like to bring up my past up, but it's just insane. Well, I think the reason is because you wrote this book and you have expressed a desire and an intention to help people. And yep. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think Robert Downey Jr. has done that. No, he hasn't done that. Mm -mm. When you saw how badly you were treated by the media and how fickle the public can be, oh, did, yeah. did that experience change your concept or your impression of what it means to you to be famous? Yeah, you know, I when I look back, I always say to myself that I'd rather have been a voice actor, <laughs> famous voice actor, because... Then you can go about your day doing whatever you want. No one knows who you are, you know, or, you know, just be a big producer or director. But I think that, you know, when you're good at something, you should be able to do it positively. And no matter what happens in the past, you should be able to move forward, you know, without having people just continue to attack you. But I think somehow I scare people. I think that's, I do. Do you think you still scare people? I think I scare people because I'm so resilient. Resilience scares people. Well, it's a very interesting charisma that you have. You have enormous likability. I've said before, I've said this to people your whole life. You have a smile that literally heals people. Oh, thank you. And thank you. I'm glad you never were a voice actor back then because we would, <laughs> we would have missed all of that, that talent that we would get to see. Now, you know, before becoming permanently sober through rehab and therapy, you went to rehab facilities five times before but it oh, yeah. never worked and that's why we started seat we started seat those so that the person can find the rehab center that will work for them that's why we started that to find and make make rehabs a lot more ethical and make sure that they can go online and then find us the one that suits them a lot of these programs don't suit people they have to go to one that can fit them and give them the direction they need to go to make it well, is it that the rehab services were not right for you or were you just not ready? No, they, those services weren't right for me. I think anybody can become ready if you keep them away from it long enough. You know what I mean? If they, they have to find some type of connection there, even though you have to be ready for it, you still got to see. Because even when I got sober, the, um, the last time when I finally got sober, I wasn't ready. But I knew I didn't want to go to jail. The miracle didn't happen until two years later. That's when the miracle kicked in when I loved being sober and I knew what it was all about, you know? That's why you have to keep people away from drugs long enough to find, to find it, to find, to find what they need. You said something very important that really resonated with me as a judge. You said you cannot go to rehab for other people. You have to go for yourself. Yep. yep. Such an important thing to say. Such I remember when, the, I remember the judge told me, the judge told me, he goes, I got, Todd, if you use drugs again, I got two words for you, six years. And I was like, okay. I said, judge, trust me. And then the judge, what was so funny was I was doing so well after four years. The judge wouldn't take me out. He wouldn't take me out probation. I, I would have to go to court and he'd say, look at Todd. Look how good Todd's doing. Why can't you be like him? He doesn't test dirty. He's doing great. And, you know, it's weird because I didn't mind it. And it actually helped me. It helped me. You know, four years of that, it really worked. Well, you're one of the few success stories, so I can understand that that judge wanted to soak up as much of it as he could, because yeah. you don't see it often, I'll tell you. 26 years, yeah. I know what I'm telling you. Now, yeah, you, you, you just mentioned a miracle. You wrote that God touched you while you were in rehab and helped you oh, get yeah. out of your own way so you could listen to the counselors who were trying to help you. Well, that's one thing God had told me was, you know, he said, uh, close your mouth and open your ears and listen, you know? 
and let I will pin the, put the people in your direction to help you continue to stay sober and be happy at it. And that's what he did. I just shut up, started listening, and it worked. Can you explain for us, Todd, how did you know that it was God who made the difference in your life that helped you turn that corner? Because God was trying to always get me out where I was using. He sent a rat one time to talk to me, you know, to get me out. And, and I don't believe I was that high. I believe that God was literally trying to reach me. When I was a baby, I was visited by the devil who said I was, a part, I was going to be with him. And I think that, you know, we have these spiritual battles we go through with God and the devil. You know, the devil tries to get you and God also wants you on his side. You know, you have to be a willing participant for either side. And, you know, I think that I've always been on the right track and the devil keeps trying to deter me to go another direction. But I believe that my ultimate goal is to save as many people as I can. And that's why I continue doing the work that I need to do. And I'm doing so God's work. I won't do his work. Can you tell the difference between you having an inspirational thought and God communicating oh, yeah. with you? God's voice for me is very direct. He directly talks to me and tells me what he wants. Now, I'm not great at doing everything all the time, but when I don't, you know, there's ramifications for everything. So, you know, and that I do know. So I don't like ramifications. So I just do what he needs me to do. What do you say to people watching this interview who may have an addiction, but who don't believe in God? Well, well here's the thing. Bill W. wrote a big giant blue book that tells you in that program, the only way you can stay sober, he said, I've tried every way. The only way it worked for me was I found God. That was the only way he was able to stay sober. He, you know, you can find a doorknob, but in your time of need, that doorknob ain't going to help you. You can't put your faith in someone else. It has to be a higher power. It's the only way it's going to work for you. You know, when we had Tony Orlando on the show and I asked him what was the major factor in persuading him to get sober, he said it was when he finally realized the hell that he put his mother through and he just couldn't bear to hurt her that much anymore. Is that how you felt as well? Oh, yeah. You know, the thing about it is what's a blessing to my mom is to see me completely sober today you know, and to stay sober, you know, and not battling the stay sober, just, you know, living my life, you know, that's, you know, a mother's love never goes away. It's always there, you know, and what, what I mean by that is like, you can see a kid, a person who's killed 10 people, but you'll have that mother since saying, but that's my baby, you know what I mean? And, you know, you, you know, mothers play a big part, but I also think fathers play a big part. I think that fathers have to be a little more loving, but stern also, they play a big part in kids' lives. They just do. Well, shortly before your father died, you made peace with him and he apologized yeah. to you. Uh, how difficult was it for you to forgive him? It was difficult, but at the same time, I knew that my counselors were telling me if I didn't forgive him, I wasn't going to be able to stay sober. So I knew I had to do the work that, you know, make sure I forgave him. A big part of your recovery and healing had to do with finding a way to let go of all the anger you were carrying inside of you. And you did that by forgiving those who hurt you, right? Oh, yeah, I definitely did. Sure. Well, as you know, there was a TV movie made in the year 2000 called After Different Strokes, When the Laughter Stopped. You were portrayed by Corey Mendel Parker, and you actually <laughs> played a crack dealer in that movie. <laughs> yeah, selling what myself you, drugs. <laughs> what did you think of that movie? I thought I thought it was okay, you know. I think what's going to be really good this year, I think it's coming out this year, they're doing, a, they do, they did the Gary Coleman documentary, and you're going to find out a lot of stuff, not only about the show, but about Gary, and about what happened, what he went through also. Are you in it? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It's going to be very detailed. Oh, well, I'm definitely going to look forward to that. I know you wrote, produced, and directed a short film about your life called Building Bridges. Yeah. Would you like to see that become a feature film or a miniseries? Well, we, we have, we, we already have a script written by Barry Michael Cooper, who wrote He Got Game and a couple other movies. And it's called Killing Willis. Same thing, it's called Killing Willis. And it's my life story. And it's raw. It scares a lot of people. It scares a lot of people. Snoop Dogg talked about he wanted to do it, but he hasn't gotten back to us again yet. So we'll see. But it scares a lot. It scares people because it's so strong and so riveting. But my thing is, that's what helps people you know, find the light. You have to be, I'm so tired of these biopics being these little wash, wash biopics, you know, not showing what really, really happened. And to me, you know, you can't help anybody if you don't really show what happened. Well, I've read a lot of celebrity memoirs in my time. 
And yours is one of the rawest. It's one of the most graphic that I've ever read. You somehow really were able to pull off the veil. You told it exactly like it was. And I would think that if the movie has a script that's based on that book, Mm -hmm. that will be not only a very compelling piece of art, but you're going to save the world. That's my plan is to do as much as I can do. That's what God wants me to do. But you're always fighting against the enemy. You got to remember that. They don't want you doing that. They don't want you saving people. Well, who do you see as the enemy? Well, that's what I mean. You don't see the enemy. The enemy is, is the darkness. The light always prevails, but it takes time to produce the light. And the darkness fights against the light and looks like it's always winning, but it doesn't. In the end, it will lose. The light will always take over the darkness. And I think that it's just a matter of time before this movie gets made. And it's going to help a lot of people. It's going to help a lot of parents. It's going to help a lot of people recovering from alcohol and, you know, and drugs and all that. It's going to help so many people find that there's ways of doing things that you don't have to destroy yourself involved in doing it. Because we're still... You know, we have high suicide, we have high drug addiction, we have high ODs. You know, United States is probably number one with ODs on drugs. You know, like 100,000 people OD every year in the United States. And it's just now being recognized because it's affecting the other communities now. When it only affected the Black communities, people were like, oh, that's only for them. But now it's affecting everyone. Everyone's being touched by it. So it's not that easy anymore. Oh, it absolutely crosses every socioeconomic, yep. every racial, every cultural, yep. ethnic barrier. I was yep. so deeply touched and moved by your book, by the courage it took not only to address and heal your pain and the anguish you experienced as a child, but also to share your story with the world. Was writing the book therapeutic for you? Oh, very therapeutic. It was one of the most therapeutic things I did. You know, that helped save my life also, you know. And I've had plenty of people come up to me that saw me share about what happened to me on TV and said it saved their life. One of them was Sugar Ray Leonard. He got on right on you know, TV and said, I saved his life because he was hiding a secret that he didn't know how to say it. And then when I came out, it gave him the courage to come out and say the same thing. And it saved his life. You know? And that's the thing. You don't know whose life you're saving, but by, by putting yourself out there, you're going to save somebody's life. And that's all that counts. Now, you returned to acting in 1996. Mm -hmm. Your career has been going very strong ever since. You've had a very successful comeback. And you mentioned something earlier in this interview. You talked about other actors that have made big comebacks. I can think of Robert Downey Jr., Drew Barrymore, Elizabeth Taylor, Ben Affleck, Bradley Cooper, Rob Lowe, just to name a few. (laughs) This may be a bit of a controversial question, but... I want to ask you, Todd, do you feel like it's harder for Black actors to get a second chance and make a successful comeback than white actors? Oh, yeah. yeah, we know that. Because not only do you get pushed down by the one side, you get pushed down by your own people also. That's the biggest thing. You're being pushed down by everybody. It's like if one community pushed down the white actors, they still would have someone to help them bring them back up. We're being pushed down by both sides. So it's very difficult to rise back up. It is, but I'm going to keep fighting and, you know, one day it'll happen. I know that. It will again. Oh, it absolutely will. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Todd Bridges by his merchandise and tune into his live streams by going to his official website, realtoddbridges.com. For more information about the Society for Ethical Addiction Treatment, please go to their website, seatsociety.org. And for more information about the Todd Bridges Youth Foundation, please go to toddbridgesyouthfoundation.org. Well, Todd, I have only one more question for you, and it's this. You said in your book that you've reached the point in your life where you've not only forgiven yourself for some of the choices you made, but you wouldn't change a single thing that you've been through. And I was astonished when I read that because it's such a monumental statement. Did you really mean that if you could go back in time, you wouldn't change anything? If I changed the thing, it wouldn't make me who I am today. You have to be, you have to accept where you are in life. You have to be willing to accept that you don't go through all these things without God's perfect world, taking it and making it into something beautiful. And if I go back and change something, it's going to change, completely change the course of my life. I wouldn't be where I'm at today. You know, and the thing is, it's, it's all about 
no matter how much money you got, no matter what you're doing, it's all about happiness. You have to be happy. If I change something, I may not be happy. You know, you got guys who got billions and billions of dollars and they're not happy. They're not happy people, you know, and people, you know, all the money in the world cannot save your health. I still have good health. It's like my shoulder being a little weird, but I still have good health. And it's a blessing. It's a true blessing. I think that's such an incredible message you've just given because so many people I've known have said, oh, if I could only go back and change this or change that. And you're presenting a perspective that's very healing because you accept that we can't go back yeah. and you make us grateful that we can't go back. Do you get that in some ways you're far more than an actor? You're actually a healer? I've sometimes, you know, I, I've helped a lot of people through a lot of stuff. And I don't need my recognition down here. You know, I, I'll get my recognition up there. So I'm okay with whatever, whatever I have to go through down here to continue. As long as I get up there, I'm, I'm okay. Please don't go up there too soon. And please allow, <laughs> no. please allow me, a long time. please allow me to give you some recognition. It's been such Thank a you. pleasure meeting you, you, having this opportunity to discuss your life and your career. I want to thank you for finding the strength and the courage to share your life lessons with us. Oh, thank you. And for being such a great role model for so many people who have faced the same struggles you've faced. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Thank you. Appreciate it. Our guest has been actor, humanitarian, and author Todd Bridges. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Robert Monaghan, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.